this is the third uh, lesson on Christian doctrine of the doctrine of faith only versus biblical faith. We talked yesterday about the importance of faith, uh, that faith is important, but so is obedience. And we've looked at several examples of people who taught uh, in the New Testament. You have John the Baptist, you have Jesus, and then you have the Apostle Paul or the Apostles. And we want to talk about Paul because there are a lot of people that believe that Paul taught grace only or faith only. And that's just not true. But why is it not true? Did Paul teach faith? Absolutely. In Ephesians 2 and verse 8, he says, by grace have you been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, lest anyone should boast. And so saved by grace through faith. Some people would say that <clears throat> faith in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is, a, is the gift. Salvation is the gift. By grace, you have been saved through faith. It's clear that when people were taught the gospel, they had to believe the gospel. And that that belief led them to obey the gospel. Now, we're talking about Paul today, and uh, the the question of, did Paul teach the doctrine of faith only? Uh, since none of those that we've mentioned in the first two sessions taught faith only, why would Paul teach it? That would have him in in conflict with the other New Testament teachers and even have him in conflict with Jesus, which we showed Jesus did not teach faith only. Sometimes when we hear the word faith, it it's, includes other things, but it is the foundation of becoming a Christian because if you don't believe, then nothing else matters. But now in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, we know that Paul was... Uh, confronted by Jesus in a vision on the road to Damascus. And he was the Lord's chosen vessel. Jesus chose him, handpicked him to preach to the Gentile world or an instrument in Acts 9, 15. Would he teach something different than what Jesus taught? Would he teach something different than what the other apostles taught? Somewhere along the way in my studies, I came across this uh, teaching from someone that, well, Paul taught grace and Peter taught uh, obedience. Now, in Galatians 2 and verse 7, this is the text they had appealed to, that you see clearly that Paul had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, that is, Gentiles just as Peter had been entrusted to the circumcised, which is the Jews. And the supposition by some is that the gospel of faith only was taught from Paul to the Gentiles, and a gospel of repentance and baptism was taught to Peter by the Jews. Well, if that's the case, they didn't teach the same gospel. And people would be very confused, say, well, who baptized you? Well, Peter did. And, you know, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, how these people were kind of basing their allegiance to Christ on the person who baptized them. And Peter was in that list. And Paul baptized people. Uh, and he, he said he didn't keep a record of it. But the supposition is that Galatians 2.7 teaches that Paul taught grace only, faith only to the circumcised, and Peter taught repentance and baptism. Uh, Paul simply means here, as he wrote this, that he was entrusted with the gospel for primary outreach to the Gentile nations. That was his target audience. And Peter, his target audience was primarily to the Jewish people. The Jewish population was very high in the first century. The first Christians were Jews who heard the gospel preached on Pentecost. The men that Jesus chose as his apostles were Jews. Paul was a Jew. Uh, and, and yet the text is not teaching they taught different things. The text is talking about their audiences and who they taught. And so uh, there, it's not that they're, and if 
if they were teaching a different gospel, then this would have Paul pitting himself against his own teaching. Because in chapter one, verses six through nine, Paul talks about not being another gospel. And he says, if anyone preaches another gospel, let him be anathema or accursed. Mike, you want to find that and read it? Sure. Uh, beginning in, <clears throat> excuse me, beginning in verse six, Paul said, I marvel that you're turning away <clears throat> so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you other than what you have received, let him be accursed. So if Peter taught a different gospel than Paul did, Paul would have said that Peter was accursed. Right. Or either that or Paul was was not telling the truth here. And there are there's only one gospel and there's only one way to be saved. Right. The religious world is very confused about that. Uh, and you, you've had your discussions, Mike, and I have too, with people say, well, that's not what my church teaches. Let's say you show them what the Bible says. And so, all right, then one of us, or maybe both of us, are not teaching the truth. And so if, there, if, there's, if a different gospel is taught, let's say that, that Mike and I are teaching somewhere and we leave grace out and all we talk about is obedience. We have not given a full exposition of the gospel. If all we talk about is grace and we don't talk about baptism, we, we're, we're not teaching the full gospel message. Right. And so Paul and Peter were not in conflict with one another. And Paul was very clear that what he preached was received through a revelation through Jesus Christ. That's right. So, and you know, Paul, you know, uh, Brother Roger, in Ephesians 4, verse 5, Paul said, there's just one faith. Right. Which is the one gospel. And, and sometimes the word faith in the New Testament is not, Ephesians 4 is not a personal conviction. Like you said, it's the gospel. It's the truth that makes men free. And so faith sometimes is a person's personal conviction. But if Paul says there's one faith, he also says there's one Lord and one baptism, then there are not many right. faiths. There's only one. Now, right. none. Of, notice here as we get to the next page, we've established that Paul and Peter would have preached the same gospel message. Just as Jesus commissioned to the 12 apostles in the beginning, and and so none of them preach faith only. Paul didn't teach faith only. Nowhere do we read that Paul ever penned the words faith alone in any of his letters. Neither does he anywhere say grace alone. And I, I wanted to think about something here. Sometimes when people talk about not being saved by works, they say, well, any kind of works any kind of works. Well, we looked at uh, Acts chapter 10, 34 and 35, where Peter said, I receive a, a, of a truth that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he who fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. And so there is a work of righteousness that would be in accordance with the righteousness of the gospel. Repentance is part of that. Uh, confessing Christ is part of that. We're not earning anything by doing that. We're just complying with what God said. Now, in Romans, when Paul talks about works, he's not talking about just any kind of works. And I believe more often than not, he's even in other letters, he's talking about works of the law. As the first century, now, let me clear something up. Jesus did choose Paul to preach to the Gentiles, but he did not exclude preach to them exclusively. He preached to a lot of the Jews. Mm 
And he had to explain to them, uh, the Christians in Rome, that you're not saved by the works of the law. And so in, in Romans 3 and verse, well, let's go look at Romans chapter 3 and look at 19 and 20. Uh, prior to that, he had been talking about uh, in verse nine that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. And then he, he quotes from the Old Testament and he says, there's none righteous, no, not even one. And so no one is righteous enough for God to save them. Paul makes that clear. It doesn't mean there's no good in them at all, but their 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 righteousness will not save them. And yet he says in verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, he's talking about the law of Moses, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Well, if you study the letter to the Hebrews, you know that that the law was, was not capable of forgiving us of our sins. It's, it is a code of behavior, yes, given by God. But if you violated the law of Moses before Jesus came along, there was no, there was no forgiveness until Jesus died. But when Jesus died, the law became null and void. And we can't be under two laws. We're, we're under the law of Christ. And so Paul says, by the works of the law, no one will be justified in his sight. All the world may become guilty before God. And verse 23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, that's both Jews and Gentiles, or in the first century, Jews and Greeks. Now, all of this is in contrast to verse 22 where it says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, true, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, yes, we're saved by grace. If Jesus had not been sent to die in our stead, we would be lost. We read that from uh, Romans 5 yesterday, that, you know, when we were without strength, Christ died for us. Nothing we could do on our own. Does that mean that we don't do anything at all in response to the gospel? And, it, and if the law wouldn't save, and the, and the gospel was meant for Jews <laughs> and Gentiles, and they all would do the same thing. Now, let's notice uh, another text here. Notice our wicked past. The, when the kindness of God for us, he saved us not on the basis of deeds. This is Romans 3, 3 through 8. Uh, let me just go back and read it. Let me just back up. I'm sorry. I knew that wasn't right. Titus 3, 3 through 8. My apology there. I want to back up to verse 1. Titus was an evangelist for Christ on the island of Crete. And Paul is speaking to Titus about the Christians on that island. He says, Remember, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. Let, let no one malign you. To be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. Uh, and that's just, that's the past. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done, in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now, some would read verse five to say, see, see there, you, there's nothing 
you don't have to do anything to be saved. Well, if Paul says in Romans 3 that there's none righteous, no, not one, I could be, I could try my best to be a good person all my life. I would make mistakes along the way, but let's just say for the sake of illustration that I was so good, and I know this is impossible, but, but I'm so good, God, I don't sin. Well, first of all, that's not true. But it, even there are people who live wholesome lives and they try to live for God. But I can guarantee you they sin sometime in some way. Now, what, what does he mean then by the kindness of God? Because God in his love and kindness and his mercy uh, saved us. But how did he do that according to Paul? He says by in verse Five of Titus 3 by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Well, first of all, it says that God's love and mercy in giving Christ, that's the basis of man's salvation. That's God's part. But what of this washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit? What is that? It's an, it's an allusion to baptism. When you go to uh, Acts 22 and verse 16, Ananias told Saul of Tarsus, who wrote this letter, by the way, to, he said, now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Well, when would Saul's sins be washed away? simply by the grace of God, simply by the mercy of God. Of course, that's the foundation. But in order to be forgiven, he had to be baptized for the remission of his sins. Well, that's what Peter taught in Acts 2.38. Ananias is teaching this to Saul of Tarsus. And so he was just doing what every person is expected to do. And so it's being born again by regeneration. I love the fact that when when a person does what the Bible teaches and, and they believe and they confess and they turn from sin and they're baptized, it's called a new birth. Jesus would tell Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and verse 5, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. At that time, John the Baptist was baptizing people in, in a baptism for the remission of sins. So was Jesus. And so, of course, John's baptism faded away when at Pentecost, after Pentecost, but Paul's talking here about regeneration. Yes, the Holy Spirit plays a role in our regeneration. We know what to do to become Christians by the teaching of the Holy Spirit, and it has to do with a washing. Well, if we're saved by grace alone, then Paul has put something in here a requirement in here that is contrary to the idea of faith only. Paul was told clearly by Ananias, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. There's not a Greek teacher in the world in the, of the New Testament that cannot understand what that means. And so am I earning my salvation, Mike, by submitting to baptism? No. No. At all. But what happens when a person is baptized scripturally? They're, well, they're, they're born again. That's exactly right. And they're forgiven to wash. In, and now here's the thing. Paul did not wash away his own sins by being baptized. But he had to be baptized for his sins to be washed away. And so let's look at... Uh, Colossians 2, 11 through 14. Mike, if you don't mind, I'll let you read that. All right. Why don't you start in verse 9, if you don't mind? Okay. <clears throat> in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In him you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, 
buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Go ahead and read 14. Okay. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So let's let's walk through this. Jesus, in Jesus dwell the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form, and one who is in Christ has been made complete. Uh, an, an alternate reading there, or it could be could be made made full. And Jesus is his head over all rule and authority. Now, the circumcision that we're talking about here is, is a figurative circumcision. The Jew had to be circumcised physically as a part of the covenant. That started with Abraham, but it was also carried over into, for the Jews under the law of Moses, they were required to be circumcised. And the circum, but the circumcision here, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a figure, an example of the sign of the covenant of Christ when one is baptized. But Paul says that you, <clears throat> he says that the circumcision that he's talking about here. When you were, verse 13, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, now obviously that's an allusion to the Gentile people. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all transgressions. Now, Paul is addressing a problem in the early church that if you go back to Acts 15, the Jews were requiring the Gentile Christians, they said they couldn't be saved unless they were physically circumcised. And that's that's physical circumcision is not a part of the gospel but paul is using a figure here that's like the physical circumcision and it's baptism now watch what he says <clears throat> he says he in the latter part of verse 12 you were buried with christ him in baptism and then you were raised up with him through faith in the working of god baptism is not a work but it is a faith response to the work of God. And people say, well, baptism is a work and we're not saved by works. That's baptism is not a work in the sense that they're using it. It's an action on my part. Isn't it interesting that in the first gospel sermon in Acts 2, after Jesus had gone back to heaven, and the apostles were preaching under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The answer to their question about what to do was to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Well, did they earn their salvation by doing that? No. And 3,000 people did that. Why? Because that's the only way they could get forgiveness. But it's based on the fact that Jesus died. And, and yet you have to be buried with him in baptism, but it's an act of faith in the working of God. And we need to make clear that we're not teaching that baptism alone saves people. We're not teaching baptismal regeneration. Water doesn't save us, but it's the agent that God used for us to be baptized. And you're baptized in water. Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected. And in Romans 6, you have a parallel of that with baptism. And so baptism is necessary, but it is, a, here's the thing. Notice how this flows out, that when you were baptized, notice he says in the middle of verse 13, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us of all transgressions. When were, they, were we forgiven? Or are we forgiven in baptism? And, and so you can't just pluck out a few verses here and not look at others and, and understand something clearly. Now, Mike, what is verse 14 talking about? Yeah, if I could just maybe uh, add one thing by way of supplement to what you said a minute ago. Uh, you know, when, 
when, when I think about circumcision and you went back to Abraham and circumcision, it, it involved the physical cutting away of skin. And the circumcision here is a spiritual circumcision and it, re, and it involves the cutting away of sin. But, you know, in Colossians 2, when it says, you know, you were raised with him through faith in the working of God, some translations say through the operation of God. And so in my mind, the picture that I get is that God is doing a spiritual surgical procedure on us. In other words, he's cutting our sins away. Well, when does that occur? Well, as you said a minute ago, it occurs when we're baptized because it's in baptism. It's at that point that we contact that cleansing blood, and you you noted uh, what Paul said in Romans 6, well, if we're going to contact that blood, we go where it was shed, and that's why Paul said that we're baptized into his death in Romans 6, 3, and so, uh, you know, it's if, if, if anybody's working, it's God. God's the one doing the surgery, not us. We're just complying to his, we're just complying to his command. I have to ask a question. Does repentance is repentance necessary to be to become a Christian? Absolutely. That's something I have to do. God cannot repent for me. That's right. He can tell me to repent. But I decide what I'm going to give up and what I'm going to take on, what I'm going to reject, and what I'm going to accept. I decide that but I'm still not earning my salvation in doing that. That's right. But you can't be a faithful Christian and live in sin. You have to repent. That's right. And I don't know of anybody who teaches any type of thing with regard to salvation that doesn't believe that. Why do they struggle with baptism? I don't know. Uh, you just have to ask different people. But baptism is necessary. It's not a work of man. It's a faith response in the operation or the working of God. So it's a faith response. Right. And when a person is baptized, they don't baptize themselves. Somebody else does it. You just submit to it and they put you under the water and bury you completely. And you come up out of the water, reborn, born again. Now, let's look at some important points that we yeah. want to observe about the letter to the Romans. Do you have something else? Well, you 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 asked me to comment on verse 14, and I never did that. that oh, I'm sorry. Bad. Go ahead. Uh, uh, but Paul said in verse 14 that the old law, that is that Mosaic law, Mosaic dispensation, Paul said that it was taken out of the way. It was nailed to the cross. And so... What what Paul is simply saying there is that we're not we're not under that old law today, but rather we're under the law of Christ. It's a different it's a different covenant. That'd be a good word to use. It's a different covenant. Bear in mind also that Paul is talking to the Gentiles here. They were under a certificate of debt. Uh, that is, they owed they owed something to God. They could not pay. You know, there's a, I think we have a hymn about that. He paid the debt we could not pay. And I believe the major emphasis here is on the Gentiles, but it also is on the Jews. And I'll tell you why I believe it mostly has to, well, it could be both. And it obviously is. But then he says, because it's what he says in verse 15, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them having triumphed over them through faith. That's Jesus. You know, he triumphed over, Pilate and the Jewish leaders that had him put to death. And, and actually he made a public display of them and say, look, I beat this. I'm, I'm alive. And uh, now verse 16 says, therefore no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day things which were a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. You've got two audiences here. You have the Jewish audience, the people who had converted to Christ, and then you have the Gentiles. And we know in Acts 15, some of the Jewish 
Christians were trying to impose physical circumcision on the Gentiles and said they couldn't be saved. And Paul dealt with that. But also here, the you got converted Jews and these other Jews say, well, wait just a minute here now. Uh, you got to you. You still got to watch your food. You you know you be careful what you drink, and you got to go to these festivals, and and you you know you got to keep the Sabbath, and and Paul say no, you don't, not now, you're under the law of Christ, and so that also tells us that we don't nobody keeps the Sabbath today, or well, they shouldn't. Now let's walk through this. Uh, at this point, then, let's consider the book of Acts with re in comparison to the letter to the Romans. The book of Acts deals mostly with the conditions of salvation. It is a book of conversions, what people must do in order to be saved. While it does present Jesus as the solution to sin, that's Acts 2.31 to 36, and Acts 3.13 to 26, there's a strong emphasis and detailed explanation in Romans of what the Jews and Gentiles had to do in response to God and his son for salvation after they had become Christians. People need to remember that the letter to the Romans is not a book of conversions. It's a letter written to people who are already Christians. And he's dealing with some of these issues. The same thing with Colossians and, and Ephesians. and, and uh, But in particular, Romans is not a letter about how to become a Christian. Now, did Paul say something about salvation and confession in Romans 10, 9, and 10? He did. And the, the reason that he mentioned that is because if the Jews would not confess that Jesus was the Messiah, was the Christ, they couldn't be saved. But, and they, and, but he says, you know, you confess him as Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead. And then, you know, you confession, mouth... Confession is made unto salvation. If a translation says that confession is made because you're saved, it's a false translation. That's not what the text teaches. Now, let's just follow this again. So, Paul's number two, Paul's letter to the Romans is not a letter about how to become a Christian. It provides the grounds for salvation. It is not designed specifically to tell what one must do to respond initially to the gospel. If people fail to realize that, they're going to read Romans incorrectly. And another way to compare is that Acts tells us what to do to be saved, and Romans tells us how and why we can continue to be. Now, did Paul deal with unsaved people in Romans 10? Yes. In verse 1, he says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them or Israel is that they would be saved. So yes, he but he was talking to the Christians at Rome about the, his Jewish people, and he wanted them to be saved. And if they would confess Christ, they could be. Was that all they had to do? No, it's not all they had to do. Because you got back up to chapter 6, he talks about baptism into Christ's death in verse 3. And you rise to walk in newness of life. And that's and that's an implication or an indication of being born again. And so bear in mind the purpose of Acts and the purpose of Romans. So look at verse number four here. Romans mostly clarifies man's desire. I'm sorry, man's dire need for salvation and what God did by his great love and his mercy to save, justify, reconcile people, and help people remain saved. Consider Romans 5, 6 through 8. We, we looked at that yesterday, but Romans 5, 6 through 8 is the grounds, what man could not do in and of himself to remedy his sin problem, God did it through Christ's death. It's Christ's blood that justifies to save man from God's wrath. Let's look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Well, let's just go back and look at this again, beginning with verse six. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Look at verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. I don't want anybody to hear us in the churches of Christ teach that Jesus is not important. Or to, to say, well, you don't teach the cross or you don't preach grace. Yes, we do. Maybe we don't do as good a job with it as we could, but we believe in grace. We believe in mercy. We certainly believe that Jesus paid the price for sin. And yet, it becoming a Christian doesn't end with that. And we see in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. And that the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's still the need for now, I want you to notice this right here. When And they, I think these are key verses in studying Romans. Both Romans 1.5 and Romans 16.26 talk about the obedience of faith. Now, I want to add something, make something clear here. This obedience of faith is primarily, primarily talking about Christians being obedient as Christians. And... That's another thing. That's a contradiction. It's in conflict with the doctrine of once saved, always saved. You cannot be saved without obedience. And once saved, if, and if you disobey, then you're not you're not you're not going to be saved. Romans ten sixteen, Paul said that they did not all heed the good news, or other translations say they did not all obey the gospel. And so other translations have it differently. The Greek word here means to obey, to be obedient, to answer the door. Now, I'm going to look at that one because Romans 10, 16 is talking about one's initial response to the gospel. They did not all heed or did not obey the gospel. They've not done it, which means they have not become Christians. Does a person have to obey the gospel in order to become a Christian. Yes. They're not earning anything, but it's necessary. And so the word there obeyed means to be obedient, to answer the door in a literal sense, to heed, to listen with an obedient response. So when Paul mentions faith in Romans, he means obedient faith every time all the way through. When he talks about works, he's primarily talking about the works of the law. So the question is, does faith in Christ Jesus mean faith only? Does it mean that one does nothing to be right with God in Christianity? Uh, and so let's so let's look at Romans 1, 5 and Romans 16, 25 to 26, and that will wrap up our session for today. But it's important to read the first section of, of any letter and the concluding remarks. And Let's let's begin with Mike, if you would just read verses one through uh six. Okay. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, through whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. When you read 1.5, I believe that here that obedience of faith is initially, but also after one becomes a Christian. And in Rome, uh, Hebrews 5 and verse 9, the Bible says, Jesus is the author or the source of eternal salvation to those who obey him. You can't get around obedience. Now, Romans chapter 16, let's see, as Paul winds this letter up, verses 25 and 26, Paul would say, now to him who is able to establish you, notice that, to establish you, a letter written to establish them firmly in Christ, 
to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, who has made known to all nations, leading to obedience of faith. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be glory forever. Amen. So people say, well, you know, you're, you all teach salvation by works and, and you're legalists. If we're legalists, then so was Paul. Jesus would say in Luke 16, 26, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? Was Jesus a legalist? Legalism is making a law that God didn't make and expecting other people to keep it. Obedience to Christ does not fall into that category. It's not being legalistic to teach that we have to obey God. As a matter of fact, if we don't teach that, we're being disobedient ourselves. So we'll look next time at uh, faith and works in Romans, in, uh, beginning at the bottom of page 10. And we appreciate everyone watching today. If you have any questions or comments, please comment on our video, and we will answer sincere questions as soon as possible.